Welcome back to Sunday Vibes, one and all. As you can tell, we are not in the pub today, sadly. We just couldn't logistically make it work. But joining me on the show today, we've got Christopher Hamill and we've got Mikey McCubbin back in the building. Been a long time, Michael. How have you been? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad, Joe. Um, yeah, all good. All good. How about yourself? Yeah, not too bad, man. Not too bad. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to get myself in an optimistic headspace about the season to come because the season that's just gone is an absolute... Fest. I was just watching some of the predictions we made at the start of the season. Plenty of positivity about Manchester United then from everyone on Football Daily. It's quickly gone downhill. Hamster, how are you? Well, how am I? I feel like absolute shit. So I would not be surprised if I was oh. terrible on this episode and, not, and offered no value. So I'm looking mate, to McCubbin to carry me here. Yeah, oh come on, mate. Bit of go. positivity in the room. You're going to be absolutely fabulous, as you always are. Let's crack oh, thanks, on with mate. the main topic then, because we had lots of questions sent in. The majority of them are about transfers. Tottenham Hotspur Football Club underscore DG says, discuss the £150 million cash injection from Levy and Enoch to back Conte and reinvent the squad coming this summer. Now, if you've missed out on this news, of course, Enoch have announced the £150 million cash injection into the club. They've basically bought and sold a load of shares to make that possible. It's mm. the first time since 2004 they've had a significant cash investment. Of course, that was only £15 million. This really is huge news for Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. We also saw the news, didn't we, midweek, that Todd Burley is going to give Thomas Tuchel a war chest, Love a favourite transfer phrase, of £200 million to spend in the summer. So we thought it would be a good idea to run through the majority of the Premier League clubs and look at what they would do with a big cash injection, right? We may as well start with Tottenham because they are the team that have actually had mm. this, you know, huge lump sum placed in the bank from the owners and are rightly buzzing about it. What do we think? Who would you go for if you if you were Tottenham? Well, uh, like I normally do, I asked for people's opinion on this on my timeline as well, and it's actually kicking off on my Twitter timeline yes. as we speak. Like 120 plus responses as to what people would do if they were sporting director at a top six side and had this money to spend it is silly season has begun hasn't it and people do get Definitely. giddy about this i've seen some very generous sales prices in there i will say that <laughs> some very generous sales prices indeed right tottenham i mean we got a suggestion from at finbell2 of perisic for free gavardiol for 50 mil which well, probably ballpark. That's yeah, ballpark, roughly maybe. the right area. 50 to 60, I'd say. Conrad Lima for 25. I think that's pretty fair as well. Skamaka for 40 million pounds. Obviously, Sosuolo's absolute uh, brick house of a centre forward. Had a really good mm. season, hasn't he, this this campaign. And Jed Spence for 15 mil. Ooh. So I actually think Ooh. Finn has begun it in pretty realistic fashion. But uh, I wanted to focus on a different player entirely, which is Bastoni. Now, he has been heavily linked with them. Before I do, does anyone want to deconstruct Finn's list? Agree? Disagree? Should we just appraise it before I talk about Bastoni? Yeah, I, yeah. I think Perisic. I'm not a big fan of Perisic, to be honest, as a left wing back for Spurs. I think he does it well for Inter, but he's in quite an advanced position there. Uh -huh. And I think he would potentially struggle in the Premier League. Like, he's not getting any younger. Like, I think Philip Kostic is a much better import in that sense. Like he's been quite heavily linked with Ooh. Spurs recently. He's got one year left on his deal. His you know, his creative numbers are outrageous at Frankfurt. Yeah. And I know like Spurs as a left side isn't actually that weak. Like they do have Regalon and Sessignon then, but there but I, I think it's quite clear that Conte wants a kind of ready made top class left wing back, you know. As he always does. Yeah, you know, it with, feels with like he doesn't positions. rate Reggion and he's kind of been surprised yeah. by Sessignon. I think that's a fair assessment. So he, clearly he still wants depth there, doesn't he? Yeah, for sure. And I think that's kind of what that, that seems to be the, the sound kind of ringing out from Spurs fans as mm. well as that the, the wing back positions need to be prioritised. And I think there are a few better wing backs than Kostic over the last few years in Europe. Like he really deserves a bigger move. Um, he probably should have gone to like Inter or Lazio before, but it didn't happen. But yeah, I think Eintracht aren't in in a very strong negotiating position at this point. I think I think yeah, Spurs really really need to go all out for him. So I would definitely go for Kostic over Perisic. Um, the others not yeah, I don't, I don't mind so much. But yeah, again, I, I feel like I've not watched Spence enough to necessary to appraise him as as, as a wing back for Spurs. Mm. But um, 
But I was thinking, again, like maybe looking in Europe might be better. Someone like Riddle Baku, again, out of the Bundesliga. But like another really mobile, like right wing back, like decent creative numbers, like has, has an eye for goal as well. Um, so that, that those would be my picks, I think, for the yeah. Spurs wing back positions. It's but very, um, very the attack rest of minded if they were going to if they were to go for Kostic and Jed Spence because what they both excel at is is going forward, right? Jed Spence's exceptional quality, I think, is his dribbling. He's completing over two per ninety in the championship, which I think ranks him joint first in the league for players in his position. <laughs> And then you look at Kostic, his numbers on FB ref, absolutely ridiculous in the top 1% for most attacking metrics. Because of course, I mean, his, his output is, is scary from that left-hand side. And I'm not necessarily sure if he always plays left wing back or if or if that is kind of yeah, like, can play further yeah, forward as well, to be on fair. rotation. Because he started out as more a classical left, left winger, I think, if memory serves me correctly. But he... His defensive numbers aren't aren't massive. He does put up a decent amount of pressures. Like he works hard. He's got he's got that like prerequisite level of fitness that Conte would demand for sure. But they would be too, um, yeah, very attack minded for. But you know, Conte. I'm sure Conte would be able to mould Jed Spence into a true two way fullback. I don't know if at, at what 29. Do you think Conte wants Jed Spence though? Like uh, Conte wants 28, 29 year old proven winners. He don't want to be signing 21 year old like prospect fullbacks I don't think Conte I was reading the Athletic article today and he, they, they were very clear about this the shift that he wants to implement in the recruitment department away from young talented players as they've identified <laughs> in the past Tottenham that's a to brave line isn't it away from young talented stuff. players <laughs> yeah to, ex, to, to experience professionals like we've seen him do it everywhere he's gone Conte he signs players that are upwards of 26 that have been proven at European and elite league level I I would be incredible Incredibly surprised to see a player like Jed Spence arrive at top. I think somebody like Thomas Munier is more a likely option, to be honest with you, than a Jed Spence. Like I think he'd rather be opening up the doors for 29, 30 year old wing backs and full backs that have been at the top level and done it consistently. I think they probably aren't going to chase a Dharma Traore as they were in January. I know that he was pretty keen to bring in a Dharma Traore, who's obviously not going to join Barcelona now on that 30 million euro option, it seems, and go back to Wolves. Um, I do wonder whether, like, is maybe they have one more nibble there? Do you think they have one more nibble think, at the Dharma Traore this summer? It. I think it's definitely worth it. Like, I think he could be such a good weapon for them. Mm. But um, but yeah. then but then again, he he'd probably have to go for a maybe more defence-minded um, left wing back in that sense. Yeah. Because yeah, like once Adama's kind of go. Actually, having said that, actually, he did perform very well defensively, didn't he? In in Nuno's final season, mm. or was it the season yeah. before his final season? So maybe, maybe I'm being a bit unfair on um, Adama. I there, also, but, um, I also think he'll look to look to sign a left-sided centre back. Like as good as Ben Davis mm. has been, I'm unconvinced Ben Davis will be the long-term fault yeah. there for Antonio sure. Conte. So I definitely think there'll be a centre back in, in, in amongst the mix. Well, that sort of ties in with my uh, whole Bastoni pitch. It is interesting. Mm. I mean, that Emerson Royale has become such a useful fullback under him that that they might just prioritise that left-hand side over the right um, because he's seeing sort of inc incremental improvement from the Brazilian. Um, but he does, he is one of those managers that likes two players in every position, isn't he? And that's quite an overused phrase uh, when it Although comes he to was, any form he was, of recruitment. Matt Doherty yeah. was... Matt Doherty was playing really well under him prior to the injury. And like I think that injury to Matt Doherty, not many Tottenham fans would have said this in the first few months of him uh, this season, was a bit of a, a nightmare for Antonio Conte mm. at the time. And then, you know, he stepped in all right, Emerson Royale. But I still think if the two were on paper, I think Matt Doherty might yeah. be selected ahead of him. But this £150 million does kind of sound out that Conte has a grand vision or a grander vision than one he's been able Definitely. to sort of act upon as of yet and maybe players that are on the periphery or on the on the cusp of making the team you know will be discarded or upgraded pretty ruthlessly and i wouldn't be su <coughs> surprised if docky was one of them yeah i'll talk about bastoni then before we move on a little bit because he does play on the left hand side doesn't he in that back three of inter's very sort of um very mean uh, defense looking extremely likely that the the nerazzori will have to balance the books again and they're pretty reluctant, allegedly, according to, to most media outlets in Italy, to part ways with Lautaro Martinez, who is, of course, their star asset. I mean, at 23, Bastoni's probably their next most valuable player. Barella's 25, Scrini is 27. Uh, you might get a higher fee for them, but, you know, Bastoni's obviously got 
Got years on them. A uh, great fitness record to boot as well. I think he's missed just 12 games over the last two seasons. Super, super composed young man. Hasn't committed a single error leading to an opposition goal in 120 league appearances in Serie A. And he's one of the... He's a very modern defender, isn't he? Every time I watch him, like super good at bringing the ball out of defence. I think he's in the top 11% of centre-backs in Europe's top five leagues for carries the top 14% for progressive passes. He also receives a lot of progressive passes, which uh, sounds him out as someone who's good at underlapping, overlapping, all the demands that will probably be placed upon him by a top Premier League manager, particularly someone like Conte, right? Uh, and Bastoni, Romero, and Eric Dyer uh, does sound like a, a very tight back three. Yeah, Pau Torres is also being linked in amongst there, isn't he? As like a left-footed central defensive option. I'm not sure about Conrad Lima to Tottenham. I think that midfield area of like Benton Kerr, Hoiberg, mm. I think Skip as well. Although, like, you know, maybe they do want to add another central midfielder. But I just think like backup striker as well is, is probably quite a significant portion of that spend. Kane, obviously, this season had three, four months without being able to hit the top heights that he's, he's hit in the past and there's such a reliance on Sun. I do think the introduction of Kulisevsky, it'd be interesting to see as well wouldn't it, if Kulisevsky and Benton Kerr's fee comes out of that 150 million because they've also got Romero's fee to pay this summer because yeah. of course that was only a loan with an obligation. Kulisevsky's going to be an option. Uh, like I wonder if those fees come out of that 150 million pound pot because they're paid this summer. If you're a Spurs fan, do let me know in the comments because I think that will be a substantial amount. That could be like 80 million yeah. Like 70, 80 million euros coming out of a That's summer a point, point yeah. that come out of last seasons. Yeah, I think 40 million pounds um, for Skamaka feels quite uh, generous as well. I know he got 16, 16 yeah. league goals, but um, I doubt that they're going to gamble to that extent on a on a backup striker, right? Like you've just said, I think the money's probably better spent elsewhere. Who are we moving on to then? Yeah. Let's move on to the other club then that have had a big cash injection according to the Times and the Telegraph <laughs> uh, claiming that Chelsea are going to have £200 million to spend under Todd Burley's ownership uh, because of course he wants to set a strong precedent and show what he's all about so he's willing to invest heavily in the squad and they're going to need investment given the entire back line is leaving the club. Marcos Alonso looks set to join Barcelona of course as P were unsure of. Looks like he might be staying but Christensen's a goner, Rudiger's a goner. I mean, there's a lot of turnover there. McCubbin. Defensively, there is a lot of turnover, isn't there? As a Barcelona fan, what do you make of Alonso going to to, to the Blaugrana? Because it's weird, no? Mm. It's, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a fan, to be honest. Come on, you're <laughs> the closest thing we I, have to a Barcelona fan. I know, I mean, as I'm, I'm, no, no, I am a fan. I, I'm, I said, I, I mean, I'm not a fan of Marcus Alonso. <laughs> right, there, yeah. um, that's I thought I'm, you were just reiterate, reiterating your loyalties to Man United there. No, 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 no. No, I'm... Um, no, I've, I've become, I think I, I feel like my um, allegiance, my tie has been moved. strengthened to Barcelona since Xavi's gone back. I don't know, it's reawakened something in me. Nice, um, but uh, <laughs> but now Alonso, I'm really not a fan of Alonso going to Barcelona. Like he's, I, I guess he's fine as like an alternative to Alba if he, you know, if, if if you want to rest Alba in certain games, he offers something different from him. But I think that's kind of the problem. I was I was saying on Continental Club a couple of weeks ago, like. Barcelona are so reliant on on Jordi Alba for like creativity mm. from the left because they don't really have much of it um, on the left side of attack, especially when Pedri's not fit. So like bringing in Alonso, who's very much like a kind of arrive late in the box kind of left uh, kind of wing back, mm. doesn't really offer much creatively. Obviously defensively lacking as well. Like I don't really see what he offers to Barcelona, if I'm honest. Um, so again, it just kind of feel it just it feels a bit like this kind of Laporta regime. Again, just kind of papering over cracks. Stabbing Obviously, they don't have that much money to invest, but they could have been a bit more imaginative. Like, mm. Jordi Alba needs to be replaced at some point, and like Alonso just isn't his replacement. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm not a huge fan, to be honest. It, 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 yeah, it feels a bit of a mess signing to it, it Myers. Yeah, fair. Yeah. I, I kind of agree, and it's another position that Chelsea will, of course, have to replace as well. Um, let's have a look at Censored, a.k.a. Aaron the Pokemon's suggestion. <laughs> he says, Kunde, Sangare, Perisic, Dybala, Gvardiol. Some interesting names there, and some names that are being heavily linked in the British press, particularly Gvardiol and Jules Kunde. Uh, as centre-backs go, Kunde is on the smaller side, let's put it that way. Mm. Uh, do we think Jules Kunde can come in and be an adequate replacement immediately for a Christensen or for a Rudiger? 
I mean, I reckon so. I reckon McCubbin can probably offer a bit more insight th- than me. But where Sevilla have been very good this season is in defence, right? Because they've been mm. very goal shy up top. So I, I don't think there's any any doubt he's a Champions League level defender. And clearly, I don't know if it's the analysts at Chelsea or someone on the board, but like even under previous r- regimes. Uh, it, it, they were linked with Jules Kunde, weren't they? So I think Chelsea as a club do love him. McCubbs, have you uh, cast your gaze upon him this season at any point? Not, I mean, not not like to to a huge extent, but like yes, yeah, Sevilla have been very solid defensively. Um, again, like he's been, you know, he he's he's struck up that great partnership with Carlos, and obviously he's off as well. And I don't know. I feel I feel like anyone like. We talk a lot about like Rudiger being a big miss for Chelsea, but I think Thiago Silva's still the guy that 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 holds that defence together. Mm. Mm. Um, and I think if you you throw alongside a very talented centre back like Kunde alongside Thiago Silva, um, I, I think yeah, I, th- I think you he performs really well. Um, having said that, I think Kvardiol might be a bit more of a like for like replacement than Rudiger just because he's. I don't know. He's he's a little bit more expansive in terms of at least in terms of the role that he's played at Leipzig. He he enters the opposition half a whole lot. Yeah, he's actually scored quite a lot. Stylistically, um, feels quite similar, doesn't he? Explosive. Yeah, like he, he's a yeah, and again, like this. You know, again, he's a young defender coming into the Premier League. There's there's not a guarantee, but I feel like he would be a more exciting side mm. to Chelsea. I think um, I think Sevilla will be really reticent to let Kunde go. Obviously, we've just seen the mm. news announced that Villa have officially confirmed the signing of Diego Carlos for £26 million as well. So if he's gone at £26 mil, I think Sevilla, they're going to be extremely reticent to let both mm. of their key central defensive options go, aren't they, in the same summer? So you'd ha- probably have to pay the buyout clause, mm. which is what it's, a, it's about 60 odd million, isn't it? Which, I mean, Chelsea do have money to spend, but if they've got to get... A left back, two centre backs. It looks like they probably have to turn the midfield over as well. I think Ngolo Kante has su- suffered pretty badly this season, and you know what was once a machine has started to splutter and stutter a little bit in the midfield just because of his injuries and problems with his legs. So the suggestion of Sangare, I think, is extremely interesting. Who might cost a little bit less but is an absolute behemoth defensively, isn't he? He's putting up some of the best numbers across Europe, and we've been shouting his name for how many years now, Hamster? Yeah, four or five years. I I think this would be a really sensible purchase from them, and like playing in a, a back three it is quite forgiving if you are looking to bed in someone like Jules Koundé. Like, I wouldn't be worried about, like, is the Premier League too physical for him when he's playing next to Thiago Silva, one other, and he's got, I don't know, yeah, a... a a top level fullback uh, to the side of him but you sign a guy like Sangare and and also that it makes it less of a I don't know a, a gamble turning over the defense at the same time just because he is so defensively astute like you've just pointed out but it's he, he's not just that either I think he is probably he's not as desirable or desired let's say as Chuameni this season mm. we've seen Chuameni linked with Real Madrid Liverpool PSG but this is a guy whose skill set is very, very similar. They're two guys who who can turn it on defensively, but they have, you know, they're very, very good all rounders. Pretty expansive passing. You know, relentless in in situations that the top clubs kind of. I don't know. They put a lot of onus on. They put a lot of value on. Like great in defensive transitions. Great at counter pressing. Great at ball recoveries. Stuff like that. I mean, Sangare. Yeah. In the Eredivisie, over six tackles and interceptions, but also five goals and assists. Played in a double pivot, played in a three. Like, he's very tactically versatile. And I think he's probably going to cost half as much as Chiuameni. And you could rotate Sangare with with Kante. Or, you know, he could step in if Kovacic's injuries, he, he can't shake them off. I think he... He'd probably be willing to accept at 24 as well a, a year of, of getting what like 1500 minutes uh, um, before he's fully relied upon as being the man. Uh, so I think he'd be a sensational purchase. Uh, I really do, out of all the ones that are mentioned. Yeah, because I, I mean, I, the, the links to Declan Rice persist, don't they? But we've just got to be realistic at this stage that nobody's going to be able to get Declan Rice out of West Ham this summer. Nobody's going to be paying 150 million pounds, I'm afraid. I mean, Dybala's an interesting shout here because. They've got a lot of forward options at the club right now. They, they've got an awful lot. And I think the only way that they sign a player like Dybala, who is obviously going to be available on a free, 
just more in terms of playing time, is to move a Pulisic on, is to move Ziyech on, is to move Timo Werner on, is to make a decision over Romelu Lukaku. Does he actually operate as your central striker next season? If he doesn't, do you just try and find a buyer for him this summer? Uh, it's going to be a very, very interesting summer to be a Chelsea fan because I, I do think Thomas Tuchel is going to look to turn that squad over quite a lot. There's not much point talking about Manchester City, really, because we've seen Erling Haaland and Julian Alvarez come through the door. So that feels relatively like the majority of their business. They might add Calvin Phillips or another midfielder to the broth too. But let's talk about Liverpool because they are still linked with Chiumeni, despite the fact RMC is saying that, you know, Monaco and Real Madrid have come to a deal in principle at about 80 million euros. He wants to go to Madrid. Obviously, they've missed out on Kylian Mbappe and are now targeting a player like Chiumeni as being the key like face of the project this summer. And... You mentioned him briefly there when we were talking about Ibrahim Sangari as putting up similar sort of numbers at 22 to be doing this. And I know Sangari is 24 and he's doing it in the Edivisie, sure, and he's doing it in Ligue 1, but to be doing it for France as well. We are talking about one of the sort of primo talents in European football yeah, he's here, aren't we, Mike? To going, France, isn't it? Uh, which is yeah, we're talking we're talking about a potential midfield future for Real Madrid of being Camavinga and Chua Many, which is you know, they might have missed out on Kylian Mbappe, but that's not a bad <laughs> fallback, is it? Unreal. Unreal. Yeah, yeah. I mean I, I think the th- yeah, with with Chua Many, I mean yeah, I mean if I think a few months ago when when he was still when it still seemed a bit more even between them. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the Real Madrid move for you know could be could be done by the time people are watching this or, or, or may not be done. But um, yeah, I, I kind of felt like Liverpool were maybe a better choice for him just because mm. he'd be entering he'd be entering a midfield which has been kind of transitioning over the last couple of years. It is quite kind of um, you know it's, it's a little bit more mouldable. Um, whereas at Real, obviously, like until the final months of the season, Camavinga wasn't getting that much of a look in. Obviously, he's been, I had, think he has been managed excellently, actually, by Ancelotti in the end. But, you know, there's still that kind of sense of like holding on to, to the old guard there. Um, but having said that, like, yeah, he, yeah, he, his, his numbers are obviously amazing, kind of both defensively and kind of in terms of his passing, in terms of his carrying, and just he's. Yeah, he's a really intelligent player for 22 years old in central midfield. Um, so I kind of just think he's, yeah, he's just going to be, I don't know, I'd be surprised if he wasn't very quickly a success wherever he goes. Um, like you say, he's got that international experience. I think he's already, you know, quite a, quite a well-listened to kind of figurehead within the dressing room at Monaco, which again, at his age, is, is brilliant. He's played kind of two different midfield roles this, this season and, uh, under two different managers and ex- has excelled in both. So that that kind of adaption period, I think, will be a bit quicker for him than, than with a lot of other young midfielders um, going to top clubs. Um, so, yeah, and, and in that sense, I, I think maybe, yeah, Liverpool would have been a better option for him because, you know, working under Klopp, I think, is, you know, incomparable to working with Ancelotti. I, I think Ancelotti's yeah. a great manager, but as a coach, like, there's no comparison. Like, Klopp is you know, one of the two best um, coaches in world football. So, like, yeah, I mean, if Liverpool could get to a I think it would be, yeah, it would be pretty transformative for that midfield, which has had to kind of, mm. you know, compensate in certain areas. Like, obviously, Thiago's injury record, not great. Um, Nabi Keita's never really fulfilled his potential, has he? And Henderson's getting no younger. So they do, they do need someone in that midfield. Um, and, yeah, like... And, and and also like Liverpool are you know they're, they're as they're as a um, they, they're as big a draw as they've ever been haven't they like you know the fact the fact that they were very even in the conversation for Mbappe like proves yeah. that like Klopp has that pulling power. It'd be very Liverpool though to go out and sign Sangaro, wouldn't it? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. When when Chouameni goes to Madrid, Liverpool just go okay, well we'll take the thirty million pound option that's you know might not be the ceiling level of Chouameni, but under Klopp's coaching we can get him pretty close, and he can play in a very structured system. And obviously, Sudeshan here has suggested Chouameni at sixty million pounds. He's also accompanied him with Max Ahrens at fifteen mil, Fabian Ruiz at twenty five mil, and Rafinha. At 40, which I find an interesting shout, given mm. that the forward line now consists of Mane, Diaz, mm. Jota, Salah, Firmino. Do they need another forward this summer? I don't think so. I don't. Th- I mean, Mane. I mean, Mane might. 
leave, might he? He might announce that he's leaving after the Champions League final. But it, even then, like Luis Diaz is the long-term Manny replacement, isn't he? That that's who he is. Yeah. Um, also, yeah. just signed Carvalho, who can play ten, who can play left wing, who yeah. can play right wing. I think he'll probably see some minutes next season as well, won't they? I don't think Harvey Elliott will probably get as many minutes in midfield as, as we at one point thought, but I can see him mm. playing on the right uh, quite easily. Um, and Fa- Fabian Ruiz at 25 million is an interesting one. I'm not sure he's going to cost that. He's going to be that cheap, unless unless I'm mistaken. He's got like one year left on his deal. I, think which I don't be. think he has. Maybe he does. If, if he does, then fair enough. But I feel like Ruiz otherwise is 40 to 50 at least. He does have one year left on his contract. Yeah, yeah okay, 2023 well, at Napoli. Hmm. Yeah, fair but enough. He, well, yeah. But but again, like it's it's obvious if you're a Liverpool fan that the midfield area is like an addition waiting to happen feels like anyway doesn't it given that they never replaced Jeannie Vijnaldum last summer it looks like Jordan yeah. Henderson is a year like deeper into his footballing career in terms of like legs and work rate right? I think he's been an exceptional servant for Liverpool but this um, this season hasn't maybe quite been as instrumental as he has in the past in this Liverpool side so if they could get uh, Fabian Ruiz or a mm. Chua Mane or something like that. But I think, it's just to go back to what you said earlier, Tomlinson, like the smart buy here, which FSG often go for, is, is Sangare. Is Sangare because yeah. I think there's probably a bit of a clash, uh, not a clash of stars, but the very... Thiago Alcantara and Fabian Ruiz bring a lot of uh, the same stuff to the table, like a bunch of great ball progression, like highly technical footballers, aren't they? S- superb on the ball, like super press resistant, like qualities that Liverpool obviously want in their midfield. But then Sangare kind of does it all and is still of a enough, enough maybe perceived as enough of a raw, raw prospect for yeah, Klopp to add all that value to with his superb level of coaching. Like, yeah, I think he's probably the best buy. Yeah, you could buy both. Like, I mean, you you could buy Ruiz, you could potentially buy Ruiz and um, Sangare for the for the price of sure many, mm. um, and and cover yourself for transfer windows in the future. I know that's that's a lot that's a lot of midfielders to manage in the next season, but like if if, if Liverpool really want to cover all bases yeah. in that sense um, that might that might be the way to like, go because I don't think that I don't think they really need centre backs I don't think they they okay yeah they might need a, a, a backup right back but there, there isn't really there aren't many areas of that team that, that need work at this point no. if I'm honest like they, they, they've, they've future proofed the forward line um, like that they yeah they, they, they can really kind of throw their eggs into the midfield basket this summer I think yeah I mean I'm not really adjusting these numbers as well to, to represent like how how difficult those respective leagues are or, or how much, you know, better League One is than, than the Eredivisie. But Sangare is clearly more of a passing hub as well. Uh, clearly maybe a bit more comfortable on the ball than Chiuameni, like completes more passes, completes more dribbles, completes more progressive runs. Um, he does a bunch of stuff which would tick an awful lot of boxes at Liverpool um, better at this point or at least in the underlying numbers. The only thing I Chiu would Amen. say... About- about Sangari is if he was going to play in the Henderson role I wonder how comfortable he would be you know when you see Henderson pressing their full back in advanced areas whether or not Sangare would prefer to operate in more of a Fabinho role which is slightly more reserved and he can progress it from deeper whether he wants to be picking the ball up in those sort of final third mm. positions that you sometimes see Henderson operate well it's just whether come or not it might be better to go for a more advanced option no I think that's a valid point but he's just served under one of the most sort of uh, intense press orientated coaches in Roger Schmidt hasn't he so I imagine he's pretty well versed in that in that language now uh, and he did play on the left hand side of a 4-3-3 at various points throughout the season for PSV but yeah mainly did play in a pivot I think with a slightly more expansive midfielder next to him like I think it was Veerman or Van Ginkel so so yeah maybe maybe he hasn't got that adventurous streak in him that, that, that Klopp likes but uh, I'm sure I'm sure he could unleash it yeah, uh, let's talk about Arsenal then because they're obviously going to have a big summer of upheaval having so many players left the club recently and you know Arteta trying to fill, like, fill out this dynasty he's attempting to create. Obviously missing out on Champions League football is going to be a bit of a disaster for that but there are still players available on the market that I think will be very interested in joining Arsenal. Obviously we see the rumours of Gabby Jesus uh, coming to the club. I think that would just be... An- 
awesome signing for Arsenal. A versatile forward, can play all, all across the front line, but it's probably going to want to operate in the box in that number nine role. Presses really high, uh, has absolutely exceptional expected goals numbers, as he has across the entirety of his career, really. Decent age profile. Arteta has worked with him before, so knows exactly what he's like as a personality behind the scenes. I mean, Jesus just seems like an awesome signing for Arsenal, so I don't know whether we want to bother discussing him, really. Uh, maybe we should discuss the midfield area, because I know that a lot of Arsenal fans, including Dylan, aka Ghost4928, are suggesting a Xhaka upgrade, who I think has had an underrated season as well. You know, Xhaka gets a lot of shit. I think he's still one of the best progressive passers in the league, to be honest with you, but they want an upgrade in there because he is a little bit of a head loss at times. He's suggesting Ruben Neves at £45 million. Do we think, though, that Yuri Tielemans at £15 million less than Ruben Neves would be a better option, given that he does have just one year in his contract and the Telegraph are reporting that he's available for about 30 mil? What do you think? I think he's a more exciting player, isn't he? I think, I mean, obviously, Hamill, you've watched more of him being a Leicester boy, but I think Tielemans is a more exciting signing than Neves. I think he's a more, yeah, he's a more mobile midfielder, isn't he? Um... It kind of depends what yeah what Arsenal are going for because obviously Thomas Partey is starting in there, isn't he? Like defensively sound, but like also I think does need someone who's quite defensively astute alongside him too. Mm. Um, and I think that would really that would really upgrade the Arsenal midfield because yeah, like despite Shaka's you know great progressive numbers, but despite him being a great passer of the ball, yeah. Um, yeah, defensively he does. You know, he does go missing at points, doesn't he? So like Neves in that in that sense would be a more more sensible. But like I don't know, I, I just I just like Tielemans, um, and I feel like he's technically good enough to, to be able to play a deep lying role anyway. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what your your thoughts would be, Hamlet. I find um, like when it comes to Arsenal's midfield, I find like the players that Arsenal fans want quite puzzling sometimes because there seems to be a bit of a fixation on Ruben Neves as well. Like goes four nine two eight, put Ruben Neves down here at forty five mil, and I think like he does offer a bit more physicality uh, than than someone like uh, Xhaka, and, and that is what his his detractors will sort of level at him, right? The the Swissman that he's a great passer. I don't think anyone disputes that but that he's immobile, that he gets caught in transition uh, and thus has to make stupid decisions like hacking people down, grabbing the shirts and whatnot. I, I mean, I don't see Ruben Neves, I'd say he's probably league average phys physically, but I don't see him as a massive upgrade on, on Jack in that regard. Like he's a, probably a nicer pass. Um, not, mm, he's a more aesthetically pleasing footballer maybe, let's say, but... Yeah, I find it strange that that's the direction a lot of Arsenal fans want to go from. You know, Xhaka to, to Ruben Neves. Tielemans makes a bit more sense. Um, yeah, I, th I think I think Tielemans has a much higher ceiling than he's displayed in the second half of this season. I don't know if he's, he just kind of phoned it in or if he's genuinely knackered because, mm. I mean, he seems like an honest pro. I'd say it's more, more the latter. But he's played. He's had to do a lot of work yeah, for Leicester as well, hasn't he? He's had to cover for a lot of people. He's played like. so much football as well at international level, at European level. I think that's gone a, a little bit under the radar. Um, and his fitness record over the last two, three seasons has been outstanding. Uh, and he has, yeah. You look at his heat map this season, and he is covering big time for players down that right hand side. I mean, at various points throughout the season for Leicester, it's been like Hamza Chowdhury at right back or Mark or Brighton, and they're playing a four three three, and without. Wilfred and Didi or an outstanding defensive presence in there. He's kind of had to do a lot of like, let me just go and get the ball off the back four or let me shield like the back four a little bit more. And he's maybe lost a bit more adventure in his play because he can play number 10 or he can be a genuinely good, but I don't want to say box to box eight, maybe box to box when his, his fitness is improved or he's had a little bit of a rest. But yeah, I would go for Tielemans all day over, over Nevers. Yeah, I mean, I was just looking now, I just pulled up Ruben Neves and Granit Xhaka's sort of passing numbers. And, you know, obviously it's very hard to compare directly because they're playing two different systems. Yeah. You know, Neves is playing in a midfield two, Granit Xhaka is, he is in a midfield two, but he doesn't have the support of like a five at the back system as well. And, you know, there's not loads to separate them, you know. Like, yeah. Granit Xhaka's putting up much better progressive pass numbers, better progressive carry numbers, better pass, like, Which better pass to be expected on a more ball numbers. Side. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah it is, it's, it's a little bit of a difficult one. I kind of agree. I, I, I wonder whether or not that's the exact profile Arsenal need and 
whether or not they also need to think about, you know, if Thomas Partey was to get injured, which has happened consistently throughout the course of the season, do they need a midfielder who can cover both of those options? Like the physicality of, a, of Thomas Partey in that midfield as well, when he's not there, I think is extremely noticeable. So... Yeah, I don't know. It's an interesting one. I would probably just there on the side of Tielemans. They're obviously both fantastic players, Tielemans and Neves, but I just wonder whether there's other options on the market across Europe mm. that might suit Arsenal slightly better. We're we just going to say um, Sangare for every single club. Is that what this episode is? We can't. We can't towards? keep saying Ivory with Sangare for every single club. Let's move Options on to United well, then. I was about to Should say we... that. I mean, Arsenal have. I think the most concrete link I've seen is Aaron Hickey, and I do think it's quite interesting. Yeah. That they're signing another Scottish left back. Maybe that means that Kieran Tierney's future is at left centre back, or you know, just on the physios table. I'm well, not does sure. That just, does that just mean that, that ta- they've they've realised like Nuno Tavares just wasn't the player they thought they were signing? Like, I- is there anything wrong with admitting a seven million pound mistake? I think that they were potentially thinking he had a really high ceiling. It's worth a punt on him. Mm. I- I'm not too sure that. Whenever I've watched Tavares, I've, I've just not thought he's cut out for this level. No, I mean, he does have quite a unique skill set, doesn't he? And can be physically dominant down that left flank. But I um, feel like he'd benefit from you know, 45 yeah. games in the championship to just really refine his game. Yeah. And also, like, Hickey, like, I think he's obviously looked fantastic in Serie A, but he's not playing in a back four. Like, he's no. playing he's playing in a role that Arsenal don't classically operate in. Mikel Arteta seems to have quite a structured system, doesn't he? With that 4-2-3-1, allowing, you know, the forwards to be quite dynamic. Uh, like, yeah, you can't 19, anticipate that change anytime soon it? and sort of sacrifice an exactly, overcard's yeah. role at 10, yeah. right? And at the end of the day, like Hickey's what he's 19, isn't he? Like he's going to cost not too much because he's coming out of Bologna. But I, just, I don't know. I just think that is that like the the key signing if they end up spending 25 million on on Aaron, on Aaron Hickey? Is that better spent now they haven't got the Champions League money with another forward or another central midfielder? I'd be interested to see. Mm. He's obviously a talented player, but. Playing in the back four is a very different system, isn't it? I'm going to sign Calvin Ramsey as well. I've just, just got a fetish for Scottish fullbacks. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Uh, let's move on to United then because I replied to your tweet, Hamill, and I've been absolutely panned by all the United Did you get fans panned? I just saw selections. it popped off. Oh, yeah, mate. 30 comments, mate. I've probably had about, I think I've had about 40 replies to my tweet. <laughs> uh, and all of them, all of them are hammering one of my suggestions in particular. Uh, my, I, I, I was very quickly, I was on the bus, I thought, well, let's get the engagement up a little bit here. Let's chuck some names down. I, I threw at the, at, at the, uh, at the reply in the tweet, I said Timber, Lima, Basuma, and Jared Bowen. Now, Jared Bowen is obviously the one that has got everybody talking uh, in the replies. I have been absolutely destroyed by Manchester United That's fans because of the fee, Jared Bowen. Though, right? Was it, was it the fee United. or was it him as a player? Because... No, it's a mix of both. It's obviously a mixture of people saying, because I put, I think it would cost 75 million to get Jared Bowen out of West Ham, which I. I still believe that. I don't. Why on earth would West Ham sell for anything less than that sort of figure? I don't know. Given that he's the second best player in the club and he's under contract until 2025, uh, and also, I'd say at least 20 of the replies saying he's not good enough for United, which I think but is yeah, just yeah. like it's a classic it's United comical. fan, United fan outlook <laughs> on, on on like it's who every they... reply, mate. I, I tell you now, every reply is like oh, 75 million for Bowen. You can get Nkunku for 60. Why would Nkunku want to join United? It's because United fans hear what? Gary Neville saying like Manchester United are are owed or deserved like best in class in every single position and think that the the clubs above players like. Like Jared Bowen, or at least some of them. Don't want to tar every fan with the same brush. But if Liverpool signed him, everyone would be like, super smart. Klopp's going to turn him into a 75 million pound player within 18 months or less. Yeah, everyone was like, why would, like, what, you could get Nkunku for that? And I was replying to people like, why on earth would Nkunku want to come to Manchester United? And they were saying, well, why would Bowen? Well, number one, I don't think Bowen will have offers from, you know, Madrid, PSG, Bayern, Chelsea on the table. Like, Nkunku is extremely likely to do. I think he's going to have at least one of Europe's four or five best clubs in his DMs <laughs> this summer. And we're talking about the Bundesliga's best player this season, who's a French international, like... PSG, I'm sure, are going to be very interested in. Madrid have just flopped it on Mbappe. They're going to want another forward. I'm sure they're going to be very interested in Chelsea, are potentially turning over a whole front line. I'm sure they're going to be very... Like, United, got to be realistic. They finished sixth. They're an extremely undesirable proposition right now. It's an absolute mess behind the scenes. Like, I just don't see a world which Nkunku looks at that and thinks that's the best option I've got on the table. I'm sorry, I don't. Like, I think Jared Bowen 
you could potentially convince, couldn't you? You could potentially go, look, we've had a down season, but you know he's n maybe not going to have the same offers as, as an Nkunku. We've got a definite role on the right-hand side that is available for Manchester United that we have been crying out for a versatile forward to come in on their left foot for a long time now. You could be this guy. I think it's a... I think he's a disrespected player, Jared Bowen. Just judging by the replies to that tweet, I think he would be really good for United. McCubbin, as a, as a disillusioned Man United fan, what do you make of Joe's choices and uh, yeah, specifically Bowen? Then? Yeah, I think I, I think they're relatively sensible. I think I think the problem with Bowen is that like at that price tag, like it's it's a lot to spend on on, on an attacker. Um, yeah. in, in the year after Sancho, I, I feel especially when the attack isn't okay. The attack's been rubbish this season, right? But like the, the the real structural issues aren't really in the attack, I don't think, and and I I would be more tempted to save save the money a little bit, like hope that Ten Hag can reignite Rashford, maybe shift Sancho back to the right where he was brilliant for Dortmund for two seasons, um, and invest more heavily in the midfield and potentially at right back, and then next summer go big on a centre forward. Um, because would you not I, sign a forward this this summer, Mikey? I I don't think it should be the priority for United to sign a forward. I think the I think the midfield needs to be the priority. I think yeah, at least well probably two central midfielders need to be signed. Right. Um, I think yeah, Lima is a really yeah. good. I think Lima is a really good shout. If you can get him for yeah for, for the kind of twenty million pound mark. Um, I actually think as well. Um, you know, two years remaining on his contract. The one downside being his his fitness record isn't great, but. He's been a bit more unfashionable recently for whatever reason, but I do think Wilfred and Didi is still one of the outstanding uh, defensive midfielders that United could go out and get. And I think he'd cost half the price that he did two years ago when, you know, 80, 90 million was being was banded being banded about. Yeah. about. I, think, I think for 40 to 50 million, you could get, get Basuma, uh, not Basuma, sorry, uh, and Didi. Um, Basuma's obviously another, uh, one of the other suggestions. Um, like, I, I think now would potentially be a good time to get him. Obviously, Tielemans leaving Leicester makes that a little bit more difficult. Are Leicester actually going to sell him? Would they rather just like have mm. one more year of him? But I do still think Ndidi would be, yeah, you know, Premier League proven destroyer. Like United yeah, no desperately need someone of his profile. I mean, um, so I would still, I would still be very keen to go out and, and and try and get him. I think that's a really good shout. Um, just yeah, see if you can sort of uh, cut not cash in but take advantage of the fact he probably is perceived now as damaged goods when a couple of years ago he was our go-to answer for how to fix Manchester United wasn't he I think like appraising Tomlinson's answer as a whole you've been able to like sort of lump £75 million on Bowen which would be an overspend in my opinion probably for about you know, if you got him for like... I was no doubt it would be an overspend. Yeah. I agree it would be an overspend, but that's how much it would cost is I all I was trying to say. I was trying to give a realistic figure there. You know, like every Manchester United fan bemoans the Manchester United tax. I mean, it, it does hold true. Like, you are going to get charged more um, by virtue of being Man United. But, but like, I think it's quite ambitious to get Basuma for 25. I know he's got a year left in his contract and he's just deleted every single mm. Brighton post on his, on his Instagram. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it does look like he's off. But I think there will be competition for his signature, and that might be the starting price. But I think he'll probably go for closer, you know, th between thirty-five and forty, maybe. But I think if yeah, you, you might if right. you'd have put thirty-five I mean, in the sumo and with sixty the figures, for, for Bowen, I think you'd have got significantly less grief. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is about I, I, I maybe slightly disagree with Mikey in that I think he's absolutely imperative. United sign a forward this summer. Um, I think to go into the season with your only recognised striker as you know Cristiano Ronaldo at 38 as he will turn during the season like I think Bowen has proven at West Ham he can play through the middle when he's needed to um you you know, Michael Antonio exactly has missed striker. large yeah and Mikel Antonio has missed large chunks of the season when Gerard Bowen's been playing through the middle um so I think Bowen his ability to play off the right hand side in the future when another Central, central centre forward comes in and his ability to play through the middle if you lost Cristiano Ronaldo is a versatile option for United I don't, like I really like names like Anthony and stuff um, but I do worry like, I do wonder if they're only being linked because Eric Ten Hag's joined the club like is it just we're just going okay you know Anthony De Jong Tim, United aren't just going to go out there and sign all X Ix players or Ix players like I think it's a little bit lazy to say that. I just think Jared Bowen be a lovely fit for the club. I, obviously, seventy five million pounds is an overspend. There's no doubt about that. If I was being sensible and saying how much should United spend with him, I think forty to fifty million pounds. But West Ham are never going to sell him for forty to fifty million pounds. Uh, hence, why I put what I think would, 
would like kind of rattle a few cages at West Ham. I think if United put 75 million down for Bowen, I think they would probably let him go. Yeah, I mean, and he's he performed bang on against his underlying numbers. So I think uh, there's not a there's minimal concern from me there that he's he wouldn't be able to replicate you know these these numbers next season. What did he finish up on? 22 goals and assists in 34 starts. Mm. Ex- extremely promising numbers. He is 25. Like if he was 23, 24, I'd be saying. Well, 75 mil. I mean, it's an overpay, but he's a he's a winger. You know, they typically enjoy yeah. their primes between what 23, 27. So you're going to get some good good service out of him. I mean, if for that money, he would have to come in, hit the ground, like r- running, wouldn't he? But pff, yeah. who cares about like spending United's money? Bo- bottomless pit. I do think a right back's an interesting shout as well, Mikey. I think that might be something United look to identify um i mean i don't really have any suggestions in the role the prob- though. yeah the, the problem is i mean what rio was suggesting max aaron's like what? he would be he would be enough he would i mean to be to be fair max aaron's hasn't had a great time in the premier league but there have been enough performances where it's like that there is a there is a good right back in there he's i think he is better oh like, mate i was defending him balance. on Sunday vibes against yeah. against uh dukes and, and pat but i think if like yeah. we're saying wambasaka isn't good enough and we're just like cutting him off at the mm. knees like to get to get Max Harris and it'd be weird for me. What do you think? What, yeah, no, I, I don't I don't support it, but I do, but what what is telling about it is that there, there there aren't many other options out there really. Like I was scouring, um, kind Jets, of look, looking. <laughs> there, there have been almost no outstanding right backs outside of the Premier League mm. um, in, in 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 Europe's top five leagues at least um, this season. Like there, there, there there's been maybe I think there's been maybe one who's provided double figures for assists, and that's not the be all and end all. But there's not been there's not been that many, and especially not many who are on the market this summer as well. So that would be that is an issue, and, and it might come down to um, you know obviously yeah, Masrau has gone to, to Barn as well. So like it, it it may come down to Ten Hag having to just make do with with Dallow like uh, for for the time being. Obviously like Timber can can deputise at right back as well, right? So like I guess that's why he's been that's what that's why he's been st- so strongly linked, or at least mm. one of the reasons why. Um, and yeah, I think like Timber does have, yeah, like really good um, kind of physical qualities that, that that will suit the United defense. Whether that means he's a starting centre back at United, I'm not so sure. But like, yeah, if you were to get him in as yeah as cover at right back as well, then um, then I think that would be yeah relatively sensible at the price point, considering yeah, considering there's not really that much else out there. Because whenever I watched you in Timber, I thought so tidy on the ball, like fantastic mm. passer of the football, but. He's a small centre back, like five foot ten in the Premier League. I know I mentioned earlier of Kunde, five foot ten in the Premier League as centre half. Mm. I, I struggle to remember a single centre half in the Premier League that's been five ten and been successful. Like he he, hold, he, hold, he does hold his own, but yeah, like the Premier League is a step up for sure. Yeah, massive step up. I think like as he's played there at times, but it's been in a back three. Is Eric Ten Hag thinking maybe he's going to play a back three? Is that potentially one of the reasons he's considering Yuri and Timber and he's thinking that would improve my chances of getting something out of Harry Maguire and that's why he wants to sign a second strike to play up alongside Ronaldo? I think that things like that that you know might be under consideration. Just just uh, some wild shouts. Uh, let's do West Ham then because they were in amongst the shouts for Europe, weren't they? Uh, not that Jeff says Lengard, Dennis, Tarkovsky. Yeah, I mean, I I stuck West Ham in there because we're not doing Man City right because pretty much foregone yeah. conclusion what they're doing with their summer. So I thought it'd be boring to talk about like we've de- we've dedicated enough airtime to Haaland. Um, yeah, I quite like his suggestions. I mean, there's no point going over Lingard and Tarkovsky because they're that's well trodden ground, right? But keeping Emmanuel Dennis in the Premier League is a good shout. I don't, I don't think like Watford. By the way, look at Watford's transfer window going into the into the Premier League. I think that is some of the worst preparation I've ever seen for like a sustained assault on Premier League survival in in the modern memory. Uh, I think they're like an Emmanuel Dennis and a maybe a Hassan Kamara away from it being one of the worst windows ever. <laughs> um, but yeah, if they can get Dennis for like 15, 20, like f- fine, good educated gamble. He only cost, like, he didn't cost Watford an awful lot, so they're still tripling their money. Um, I don't think he's a good Mikel Antonio replacement though. I mean, Mikel Antonio is quite a weird one to replace because he's got a unique, quite a unique skill set, hasn't it? Um, six foot six, 
just gone down. <laughs> yeah, I mean, your Valvego shout, agent, agent terribly, as is, is, this time's gone on. Get him to West Ham, mate. Get him to West Ham. <laughs> yeah. uh, I like Dennis White. Like, his outstanding qualities are his, his sort of creativity. Well, maybe his goals, actually. But his dribbling, right? He's, 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 a, he's very good on the ball. He's very good in one-on-one -on -one situations, like beating his fullback. Like... Yeah, West Ham could maybe use a little bit more of that, particularly if, if Bowen has got suitors and they feel like cashing in on him, which I can't see happening, to be honest. But I like Emmanuel Dennis, but I don't think I've got any like really, really outstanding shouts for I, West Ham. I, I like Kaladzic, I think, from Big Stuttgart. Big Sasa Kaladzic. Uh, when, when you, when you, when you, yeah, speaking of huge strikers. Yeah, he's um, strong finish to the yeah, season. Yeah, like he, he's had quite a tough season with Stuttgart because he was injured for about half mm. of it, but he was pretty important in the second half of the campaign and keeping them up. Um so I, I would potentially look to him. I'm not sure what kind of price point they they would sell at. Maybe, maybe thirty to forty million. But in terms of like young strikers, like I think he's still only twenty four. Um, like physically, I think would adapt pretty pretty quickly to the Premier League. Um, like other elements of his game, I'm not like I'm not that strong yeah. on. But like in terms of a, a presence in the box, which I think West Ham do, you know, miss at points. Um, I, I think he would be uh, an interesting choice. Mm. Mm, let's do some quick fire questions then before we end this episode of Sunday Vibes. Uh, AM6646 says, did De Bruyne and Foden deserve their personal awards? Uh, who you going um, to be? Or, like, go on, my cubs. I don't know about De Bruyne. Yeah, the thing is, the, Pre the Premier League Player of the Year awards are like they're meaningless, aren't they? It's all about the PFA, which I think, is, are they like, announcing the, the, the shortlist soon? Um, yeah, brilliant. So late. I don't know. I, 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 I tend I tend not to bother with the Premier League ones in terms of like actually seeing what the, you know kind of assessing them, but um, I don't know with 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 De Bruyne. Like, I think Foden probably does deserve. I think it's him or Saka, isn't it, for young player? Um, De Bruyne, it's tough. I actually put out a poll on on the community feed for FD the other day of like who deserves the PFA Player of the Year award between De Bruyne, Salah, and and Son, who are the three outstanding candidates, aren't they? And it was so tight. I think Salah's currently on like 38%, Son's on 36%, and De Bruyne's on like 28%. Um, so it is pretty, like, it is quite tight in that area. Um, I think I'd still give it to Salah um, over De Bruyne. I think, like, over the course of the season, he's been immense. And De Bruyne has, like, become more and more influential. But um, as is usual with Man City, there's it's more about just how they've performed as a collective. Um, I think Bernardo Silva was more influential than him in the first half of the season um, and, and his name's hardly been anywhere near these kind of end of, awards, uh, end of, um, season awards, end of yeah. year awards list, have mm -hmm. they? I know he's like, he's not, he's not been as, as, as good in the last kind of couple of months, but like, you know, he, he definitely deserves some yeah. credit for like how good he was earlier in the campaign. So yeah, sure. I think, I think Salah would get it for me. I mean, if we go off individual yeah. contribution, like Son is obviously the one that pops, right? Like McCubbin mm -hmm. just said, at Manchester City, I think there was seven, seven players who got over 10 goals and assists in the league. Uh, I think Liverpool probably, it was probably five or six. Um, obviously Salah's numbers still sort of disproportionate, uh, <laughs> like disproportionately good uh, versus the other two. So I, I, wouldn't have begrudged him victory or Son victory, but I, I would have put De Bruyne a third. I said this in Sunday Vibes. Uh, I think Son probably split those two for me. It was Salah, uh, Son, De Bruyne. And as for Phil Foden with, with best young player, I just think it's a flawed award. I, th I don't think, you know, you can be, you should be able to be in your fourth season of first team football and, and still win young player, particularly for such a dominant side uh, in the division. Like he's undoubtedly got... Yeah one of the highest ceilings for a youngster in the modern Premier League era. He's an outstanding footballer and I love watching him, but he's already won it. Like, it, it's just, it just does feel like it's become a little bit of a popularity contest or like a... I agree. And that it's, should be it's rookie just of the boring, year, isn't it? it? I, I'd have gone for Salah and Saka to answer your question in, in more punchy yeah, fashion. Yeah, that should be rookie of the year, man. Like, it should be a player who's in the first breakthrough campaign, like the first time they've played 10 or more games in a Premier League season. Mm. And once, you, once you've done that, you can't be nominated for it again. Like, the golden I boy. think it has to be like, yeah, effectively like the golden boy of Premier League football. Because you're right, for like Phil Foden, yeah, probably does deserve it. But... It's just dull. It's so dull. Um, yeah, I would like for Saka and dragged. If we're talking, awards. if it's an individual award, Saka dragged Arsenal through this season. Like people, he's got as many goal contributions as Sadio Mane, 
But that is that still doesn't tell the whole story, does it? He I've watched I don't know ten Arsenal games, maybe thirteen this season, and he just dragged them through it at age twenty. Ridiculous. Yeah. Ready. It is ridiculous. Um, Kula HD says, "Does Lewandowski's arrival, if he does arrive, that's big old mm. question mark over that, make Barca favourites in La Liga, Mikey?" Um, it, it certainly pushes them a bit higher. Although, I don't know. I feel like there's improve again. There's improvements elsewhere in that, even in that forward line. Like Lewandowski would be amazing, right? Like, like he he could score he could score thirty five goals in a La Liga season. I think he's well capable of that especially if, if, if Barca's creator, the creators can all stay fit. But at the same time, I think Aubameyang can score 20 to 30 goals yeah. in a La Liga season. So like what, what like the, actually the, the, the kind of the differential you're getting there isn't that much. Um, so benefit. it does seem weird to yeah, go after benefit. another like veteran striker. As, as I, lo- I love Lewandowski. I think he's one of the you know, top 10 strikers of all time. But like, I don't know. Like it, again, it just it feels like Barca are, are, have got slightly muddled thinking there. Um, you know, like I don't. I know Aubameyang. You know, isn't necessarily going to like stay fit for a whole season, but like I don't know. I don't know where, if that's where the gap is at centre forward. Like you've got Ferran Torres who can play at centre forward as well, and hasn't been that consistent on the left. Like I'd rather like Barca went and got, um, you know, so, so, you know another creator um, out wide, especially with with Adama leaving as well. Um, rather than rather than like put all their eggs in the Lewandowski basket, I think. Um, yeah. So yeah, I don't know whether his arrival would necessarily make them make and them favourites. The I think, I think they're, they're going to be they're going to be challenging Madrid hard, whatever happens. Um, but yeah, whether an extra five to ten goals um, makes that happen, I'm not sure. Especially how like cataclysmic it could be for the way you structure at Barcelona yeah. to add another, you know. He's not going to be coming in on pennies from Bayern Munich, is he? He's the world's arguably top three strikers, like probably the best potentially on his day if Karim Benzema's having sure. an off day or Harry Kane's having an off day. Like, he's not coming in on 100 grand a week. He, he's going to be one of Barcelona's best paid players. I think it's a... I think it'd just be ridiculous to bring him in. I just don't understand it on pretty much any level. Uh, especially if it comes at the sacrifice... It? Especially if it comes at the sacrifice of Frankie Dion. Like, mm-hmm. if they have to sell... Lewandowski, if they have to sell Frankie to, to afford Lewandowski, like it's, I just don't really understand it. Um, let's do a personal question then to wrap up. Favourite food to make from potatoes? I'm being blinded by the sun. So, favourite right. food to make from potatoes? Does it mean, does this mean favourite form of potatoes? I'm trying to think like if there's another food yeah. that you make from sure. potatoes. No, I like this just question. potatoes. He, he's asking like how, how much can you elevate the, the, the yeah. noble potato? potato? I think I yeah. think a really good roast potato is yeah, extremely I hard agree. to eat. This fluffy in the middle and roasted on the outside. Woof. For sure, crispy on the outside, fluffy in the middle, like yeah. oil, like a, fa- a fair amount of oiliness to yeah. it as well. Agreed. Like, yeah, Maybe you a, can't a beat bit it. Of goose fat. You know I, what? I class. think you struggle to beat a roaster. You know the little crispy bits that break off and they're just in the pan yeah. at the end, and no one claims really good. them. And just like mind really sweeping good. them, bang. Like, a, how do you beat that? How do you beat that? The Americans oh. are saying chips, chips, fries. <laughs> good chips are good good chips are good but they are there's only certain there's, there's there's not actually that much difference between like a bad chip like a bog standard chip and a, and a really good chip i think you know if, you know when you Triple just find chips yourself can be great, out but... in like the countryside and you find a very nice gastro pub that does an unreal triple cooked chip and mm. they give you every they give you the crunch and the softness of a roast potato but then like the oiliness of a char oh, that's that would probably be top They're of great. my list, uh, but they are really? rare. Because some people put on the menu yeah. triple cooked chip t- chips, and they come out. They've never really been fucking cooked once. All right, stop trying to pull my leg, <laughs> fobbing me but off. You, can, but it's you know what? It's because you can get oven chips. You can get oven chips now that say they've been like previously triple cooked before being frozen. So I reckon that's probably what it yeah, is. That's yeah, it. They've just like they've given like you those classic. ones which come with the, and they are nice. They are better than standard oven chips, but yeah, look. Like, they yeah they're cheating you on that front. What's yeah good shout that. What are you saying, Tom? Listen, uh, has to, I mean one hundred percent roasties. I think Dauphin while I've done right Ooh. is not too bad. Yeah, Dauphin was great. I also, I also the, the problem with Dauphin a really creamy mash is is up there, but a roasty just mm. topples them all. I think the thing is with Dauphin while is like I do love it, but I think I love it because I have it so rarely. I think if I was to have them, like, I agree a lot. It's very rich. It would get it? too sickly. I think I'm not cooking that. Yeah, I'm not making rich. that sauce from scratch either. I mean, I'm sure it's pretty yeah. easy, but. 
<laughs> no, I agree. Yeah, uh, so we'll settle on roasties for that then as we wrap up another episode of Sunday Vise. Mikey, what did you talk about in Continental Club? Uh, we picked our team of the year, uh, oh, not so Premier oh. League based. So if you're sick of hearing about, about the Premier League, as you might be, um, yeah. yeah, go and check that out. We uh, had um, Alex, a Euro expert, on as well in Henry's place. Um, and yeah, he, he was great. Lots of detailed analysis, um, especially of league earned players. It's a bit of a strong point for him. Um, so yeah, we, we went and debated that and we also uh, previewed the Champions League final as well, which is, um, oh, actually, no, there's no point in watching that bit, but watch the first. <laughs> Wait, do you know what? Uh, watch you know the what? first, Let's... like, 35, 40 minutes of it uh, for, for, yeah, our team of the year in Europe. Let's re- make real tits of ourselves here. It would have happened last night, so yeah. we're shooting this on, f- on, like, Friday, basically, so we don't know the score. Hamster prediction. I think I already told you at Team Tour, didn't I? Uh, 3-1, Liverpool. Yeah. You think it's going to be a blowout? I think it's going to be really close. I'm, I've gone 2-2 and then Liverpool scrape it an extra time. Mikey? Um, yeah, like I think it's either going to be a comfortable Liverpool win or like Real Madrid are going to break. Like It's going to be dramatic and Real Madrid will somehow bring it back. But, um, Covering your bases. On Continental there, Club, I said 2-0 Liverpool, which is a bit boring, but I'll, I guess I'll have to stick with that. So yeah, might be looking very silly right now. Yeah, lots of Liverpool love. Feel free to hammer us in the comments for those predictions. And if you want to see other reactions to predictions, I reacted to our pre-season predictions on We Need to Talk on Friday, which are an absolute disgrace. So go and watch that if you didn't already. Uh, Thanks to Mikey. Thanks to Hamster for joining me today. You guys watching at home. See you later. Bye. Bye.